presentation of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service National Conservation Training Center, providing leadership in learning to conserve fish, wildlife, and natural resources. Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of afternoon broadcasts with Conservationists in Action. We have a really exciting show this afternoon. We have an extra special guest, somebody uh, we've been trying to get out here for about a year, and then and, and finally she, she's made out here. We're very excited about that. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Sandy Burke, who in just a minute is going to talk to us about bringing back the fish of the Chesapeake Bay, a rare success story. And before I turn it over to Sandy, I'd just like to give you a little background on her. Sandy um, is a marine biologist, an educator, an author. Uh, she's written this wonderful book uh, about really uh, living up to our name for once, Conservation in Action, particularly with young people, uh, about bringing shad back to the Chesapeake Bay area. It's called Let the River Run Silver Again, How One School Helped Return the American Shad to the Potomac River, and How You Too Can Help Protect and Restore Our Living Waters. It's really a fun book. Um, I actually I got it from her about a year ago, uh, then I read it to my kids, and then they read it to themselves. It's, it's a wonderful book, um, and Sandy, it's a real pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. So thank you so much for coming to NCTC. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I, I think we're going to have you in just a sec go into uh, a presentation showing us um, some stories about the shad and other fish in other parts of the country. I'd just like to remind folks this is live. Um, Sandy is actually here in the uh, audience with us, and we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, if you have a push to talk microphone, uh, it's very easy to ask a question. You can just push and then talk, as the name implies. Otherwise, you can email us or uh, phone or fax in a question. I think we're going to let Sandy run through her presentation, and then at the end, we would be more than happy to take any questions you might have, and, and Sandy will answer them, not myself. So it'll be worthwhile sending them in. So, so welcome again, Sandy, and, and um, let's jump right into your story. Great. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here today. It, this is a wonderful success story of how students, parents, and communities can help bring back fish. Today we're going to be talking about the Chesapeake Bay region. Wonderful success story uh, with a unique partnership between the Interstate Commission on Potomac River, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, some nonprofit conservation organizations, and some area schools to help bring back the various fish in the Chesapeake Bay. And today we'll be talking about the American Shad, our forgotten fish. <laughs> Okay, this is the start of the show. The uh, program started about 11 years ago with these students here. These are fourth graders from Montgomery County, Maryland. They, uh, like many students across the country, were participating in a uh, program to monitor their local streams and help restore them. Their program was called the Stream Teams out of Montgomery County, Maryland. That's a county just outside of Washington, D.C., on the Potomac River. The Potomac is the second largest river in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. It encompasses four states, including Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia, and includes the Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. The students in this program, like many students around the country, were monitoring their streams using these nets here. These are called kick nets, and they would put the nets in the stream and capture the living organisms that are in the stream, not the fish, but the macroinvertebrates, or small uh, animals that have no backbone, such as crayfish and caddisflies, and these students could count these animals and see how clean their streams were. In 1995, there were about 10 to 15 schools in the Maryland area around Washington where these students were doing this kind of work, and this is Westbrook Elementary School in Bethesda, Maryland. These students also would go to the Potomac River and see what kind of animals live there and what fish live there. And they were hearing about the uh, decline of the various fishes in their river. This is the river off Washington, D.C. You can see the cherry blossoms blooming in the background. They're on an old oyster by boat and they're looking for fish here. But many of the fish were in trouble. This is in 1995. It was then that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came to the Stream Teams program in Montgomery County and said, would you all like to have your students come and help release some American shad. These fish are being restored to the Chesapeake Bay. Their numbers have declined. And the students were thrilled. So in 1995, they came to Great Falls National Park 
in uh, Maryland and Virginia. It sits on the Potomac River at Great Falls. And here they're looking for American shad to see if they can see flecks of silver. These fish would flash silver in the spring as they return, but they don't see any fish because 10 miles downstream from the site is a dam and the fish could not return to this section of the river which uh, they had used historically to spawn. So these fourth graders are there to release the fish. This is an American shad. It's the largest herring in the world. It is called the forgotten fish because if all of us had been alive 200 years ago, the Native Americans used this fish primarily as a food source to survive the harsh winters. George Washington fed these fish to the troops at Valley Ford. Forge. It's a very important, was an important commercial fish, but it had suffered quite a bit of decline. It is our East Coast salmon. It started on the East Coast, and like salmon, they return, they're anadromous, meaning they lay their eggs in fresh water and return to the sea each year to spawn, to grow up. Here is a, a migration route where they're going up to Canada and they return in three to five years to their, lay their eggs. And the light blue area is the Potomac River off of the Chesapeake Bay where these fish lay their eggs. They historically stop at the great falls of all the rivers on the east coast. They cannot get up these falls along the fall line. Dams will also stop them. Unlike salmon, they do return year after year to lay their eggs in this section. At Great Falls National Park on the Potomac, you can see these fish, uh, but you couldn't see them 10 years ago. They're important to the ecosystem of the rivers of the east coast because animals such as this great blue heron feed on them. They feed on them in the spring and throughout the summer. Animals like this osprey and the bald eagles around our country genetically have developed to lay their eggs and raise their young when the shad return to lay their eggs in the rivers each spring. These animals need these fish. They are a very fatty food source for their chicks. So they're extremely important to the ecosystem. When the shad leave the rivers and the bays of our nation and go out into the Atlantic Ocean and now the Pacific, the bottlenose dolphin on the Atlantic Ocean side is waiting for them. Very important food source for bottlenose dolphin. They're also extremely important for our recreational commercial fisheries such as this striped bass. Striped bass will actually feed on shad, adult and juveniles in their lifetime. Native Americans use these fish as a primary food source in the spring. They would split them open and roast them. And in the Civil War, many battles were won or lost, depending on whether the generals were smoking fish during that time at these great shad plankings that used to happen around the Chesapeake Bay. But the fish became over-harvested. This is an 1888 picture. You can see the nation's capital building being built in the background. There's a large net being pulled by horses. People caught so many of them. They were so important last century and in the 1800s that we, we caught millions of pounds of them. This is the two-mile net. These nets would be strung across the entire Potomac River to catch this fish. But too many were caught and their numbers started to decline. In the 50s and 40s, we built dams around our country, and this is the dam that went in at the Potomac River, the Little Falls Dam. This dam blocked the shad from returning to 10 miles of the historic spawning reach. 10 miles of river above this is Great Falls National Park, where they would have spawned, but they could no longer get over this dam. Unlike salmon, they cannot jump over the small dam, even a small dam. This is a shot of the same dam. Even though it's only five feet high, the fish cannot jump above it. This is the dam shown at a drought. In 1995, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service started a program where they would restock the American shad to the Potomac River in the Chesapeake Bay. This is the fish and wildlife tanker truck dumping 1.5 million fish in the river. And it was in 1995 that these students also met the fish and wildlife biologists shown here to stock the 1.5 million shad. They were very excited by this. These fish would leave this site, go over the dam, the Little Falls Dam, go out to sea and return three to five miles later. But this site where they released it is 10 miles above the dam, and there is no fish ladder in the dam, and there was no way for the fish to return. But plans were in the work to put a fish ladder in the dam. So this year, 1995, the fish were released. This is a shot of the students releasing the fish in 1995 with Fish and Wildlife Hatchery Manager Albert Spells. They were filmed for television. 
1996, two funding mechanisms in the Maryland and Virginia area, which are license plate money, where people buy license plates with these wonderful logos on them, funded an idea to have the students raise the fish in the classroom. Students got tanks made of trash cans and built them, one on top of the other, to try to raise American shad in the classroom, just like Fish and Wildlife Service was doing in their hatchery, the Harrison Lake Natural Hatchery, National Hatchery in Richmond, Virginia. The students set up these tanks and monitored the water to make it look like and, and, and be chemically like the river water. The tanks would then be ready to bring eggs to the tanks to raise the shad. A waterman stepped forward and said that he would be glad to take the students on the river to actually capture the fish with the fish and wildlife biologists to help them bring the eggs to the Harrison Lake hatchery and then to their own tanks. This is his small boat that he took the students out on to net the fish. Here's one of the first teachers, Sandy Geddes, netting one of the fish, the students observing the fish, and then the students taking the eggs out of the fish. Here you can see one of the students in 1996 milking the eggs out of a female shad. This is done at night because the eggs are sensitive to light. In 1996, the eggs then go to the Harrison Lake National Fish Hatchery that U.S. Fish and Wildlife runs in Richmond, Virginia. You can see the biologist pouring the eggs into the hatching jar. One million eggs will be hatched in each of these bins. How we know that fish are hatchery-raised fish varies, but in this project, the eggs hatch, and when the young fish are in the Fish and Wildlife Service tanks, they were subjected to breathing in tetracycline, a common antibiotic used for treating illnesses. Every time a fish would breathe in this substance, it would mark its calcium in its ear bone, or otolith, a bright green ring. And five times the Potomac River fish had tetracycline in their tank. And so this is the ear bone of a Potomac River fish marked with five rings. When the fish returns in three to five years, if it is sampled and its ear is bone is taken out, we will be able to hold it under a light and see that it is Potomac River fish. This technique, unlike external tags, does not harm the fish in its life history. When the fish hatch, they, they are ready to release in about a week. They look like two eyes in a wiggle, shown here. The first year in 1996, the students released over 10,000 fish at Great Falls National Park on the Potomac River above the Little Falls Dam, anticipating that when the fish returned, they would be able to possibly use a fish ladder. Park rangers join the students to tell them about the national park and what an important thing it is to have the shad come back to this park to feed the bald eagles and osprey. The fish look like this. They're about an inch and a half long as they leave the park and head for the Chesapeake Bay. As the students waited for their fish to return, they did other things to clean up their streams in the river, such as trash pickups and planting native trees. These are shad bushes grown here. Shad bushes bloom a beautiful white bloom in the spring. This was how the Native Americans knew that the shad were returning to lay their eggs. They had no clocks, no calendars. They watched for this bush to bloom, and then they would come net the shad at Great Falls National Park and rivers around the East Coast. The bush produces a beautiful berry. It's also called service berry in the mountains of the East Coast. And this berry would be mixed with deer meat to make a tasty food for Native Americans. Students also planted rain gardens, capturing the runoff from their buildings so it wouldn't pollute the nearby stream and river, and planted native wildflowers at the release site and at their schools, all to help clean the river for their returning fish. But the fish could not come back to the National Park without a fish ladder put in the Little Falls Dam. And after two to three years of raising and releasing shad with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the ladder was still not put in the dam. So some of the shad students got together and went to the pol politicians with the U.S. Corps of en Arm Army Corps of Engineers putting in the dam. They went to their politicians in Maryland and Virginia and said, please help us get a fish ladder put into the dam so that our fish may return and the river can run silver again. Here they are reading their script to their state senators. In the year 2000, the ladder was put into the dam, but it wasn't a fish ladder. It was a fish way. 
This is a, is a cut made in the dam, and the fish can actually swim through these baffles shown here. This is Little Falls Dam. They swim through the ladder and up toward where they used to spawn at Great Falls and where the students had released them. The ladder or fishway looks like this, and this technology is being used all over the country right now, very successfully. The students' role in this process was recognized at an opening ceremony for the fish way. This is Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt on the right, acting Interior Secretary at the time, and their local Senator Paul Sarbanes, and their Congresswoman Connie Morrell in the back, and the head of the Army Corps of Engineers shown in the far left. And this is Ben, one of the students that helped get the ladder into the dam. The area that we're talking about is just outside Washington, D.C., and the opening of the fishway opened 10 miles of river for new habitat for spawning for the American shad. But did the fish come back? That was the question that the students wanted to know. And so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife sent biologists with the Interstate Commission on the Potomac River Basin. Here is one of their biologists, Jim Cummins, using a traditional dip net like Native Americans use to dip at Great Falls National Park to see if the fish came back in the year 2001. And they did. This is one of three fish. This is Mike Odom, fisheries biologist for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Harrison Lake Hatchery, with one of the first caught American shad to appear at Great Falls National Park in over 50 years. And this exact fish had the hatchery mark of the released fish by the students and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service three years before. It had traveled over 12,000 miles up to Canada and back up the Potomac several times to reach this spot. This fish was five years old. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service monitored downriver to see if the fish were coming back, the juvenile fish. This is a push net that is pushed through the river to capture the baby fish. And they started to see a return in the fish. The fish ladder was working. The fish were starting to come back. In the story, uh, as an author, I followed two of the students who originally released the fish in 1996. This is Nick. He wondered for years as he became a middle school student and a high school student, did his fish come back? And he would hike through the National Park at Great Falls to see if he could see the silver of the fish. And Julia, one of the original students shown at Great Falls Park earlier, also wondered, were the fish back? She would row the river looking for the silver of the fish. In 19... 95 when she released the fish she had no idea they'd return but in the year 2001 when they came back we contacted Julia she came back to her original school Westbrook Elementary the school that's the topic of the book that I've written and worked with the students the technology had changed the students no longer sent their eggs to the Harrison Lake hatchery but instead were raising the fish in the classroom themselves hatching them this is a TV shot of the ha eggs hatching in the classroom. Julia was amazed, and she helped the students to raise river grasses, to plant in the river. Having appropriate habitat is so important for the baby fish. And in the seventh year of the project, Julia and Nick both came back to help their elementary school release fish at Great Falls National Park. That was the seventh generation in the year 2004 to monitor whether the fish are coming back, giant hull seines are used. This is one used off Washington, D.C. And the data shown here shows that once the Little Falls Fishway was installed, the fish started to come back in large numbers. Also, we use gill net sampling, and you can see again through 2006, the fish were coming back. It was a big success story. The fish do face some interesting questions. In addition to the bald eagles and the great blue herons that really feed on these fish and they're so important for the ecosystem, many of our rivers have exotic invasive species that are being introduced. This is the Mississippi blue catfish that was introduced into the Potomac River years ago. This fish gets up to 80 pounds. It's thought that it could potentially eat some of the shad. And this is the northern snakehead fish, a fish that is has a snake-like head, was introduced from Asia, and is rapidly becoming established in the Potomac River. This is the snakehead's teeth. It's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a predatory fish, and it's thought that it will also eat the shad. But so far, American shad are coming back in great numbers, and so are bald eagles. 
osprey, striped bass, and other animals that depend on the shad for food. And this success story in the Chesapeake Bay has shown a dramatic increase in these birds of prey and in striped bass in the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. This unique partnership between fish and wildlife and the hatchery manager Albert, shown in the blue jacket with the fish and wildlife bucket, really was responsible for the success story. Lewis Harley, the waterman on the right, Jim Cummins of the Interstate Commission on Potomac River Basin on the far left, and the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries for Virginia, this unique partnership was able to create a restoration success story in the Potomac River for the American Shad. And this picture shows these biologists and the watermen releasing the fish now in the Rappahannock River in Virginia. And eggs from the Potomac River go as far away as Delaware and New Jersey now to restock other rivers on the East Coast. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is continuing to remove dams that block American shad around the Chesapeake Bay region. This is a dam being removed in the James River. Once this success story became apparent, I worked with some students at their original school in Westbrook Elementary to write the story down. These are fifth graders and they named the book Let the River Run Silver Again. Because in the olden days the rivers would run silver with fish, with shad and herring coming back from their great migration and they would actually turn the river silver and that was the rallying cry of the students when they got the fish ladder put in the dam. The book received two national awards recently and it was all due to the help of the students in writing the book. When the book was, book was being written I got donated a wonderful art print and in the print it showed the history of our nation's fisheries and if you look closely on the right this is an art print of Fort Washington and the netting of American shad. And what this art print showed in 1888 was the United States Fish Commission, which was the original precursor of our current United States Fish Restoration Program, sent American shad to the West Coast. And in the center of this picture are jars, hatching jars. And the fish would hatch. The American shad from the Potomac River were sent to the, chest, to the San Francisco Bay where they were released. And salmon were sent to the Potomac River. The salmon did not survive from the West Coast in the Potomac. But the shad did survive in the San Francisco Bay and now have spread up into Canada and are the largest migration of fish on the West Coast, the East Coast American Shad from the Potomac River. So it's very interesting, this transition. Once the book came out and the students had a success story, we got more funding from Virginia license plate money in Maryland to expand the program to more schools in Virginia and Maryland and now Delaware. We've linked the program to the curriculums where students count the eggs. They're tested in math and reading. And so the students read, let the river run silver again. They read about the success story and how students can help bring back fish and other animals around our country. This is Interstate Commission of Potomac River Basin, Jim Cummins, biologist, showing the students once more how to take fish out of the nets. And we've expanded now to 28 schools around the Chesapeake Bay, and over 70 schools have done this project for 12 years now with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Interstate Commission on Potomac River. And it's not just fish that students can restore. Shad schools are now bringing back Native American trees. They're planting shad bushes in their courtyards. They're doing projects like Growing Native where they collect acorns and they build native tree hatchery, native tree nurseries at their school sites and then transfer the trees to help curb erosion going into our rivers and streams. And students continue to monitor the streams to make sure that they are staying clean or being improved for returning fish such as shad. The word is getting out to about this project with students traveling to different areas. This is the head of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and a student from India who is taking the book over to Delhi to help them in their Ganges River restoration success story that they hope to have in India. With the success of the American Shad restoration, they want to preserve fish in India and try and have Indian students also raise fish on the Ganges. There's a student movie coming out on the project with students interviewing shad students. And this year is the 13th year of students raising American shad to try and keep the numbers growing. The fish are coming back in the Potomac 
and rivers around the country, thanks to Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, for taking out passage blocking things like dams. These fish will come back around the country. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also helping to try and assess whether they can bring back the American sturgeon, a fish that's really had a hard time with habitat. This is James River in Virginia. And fish and wildlife biologists are assessing whether they can raise the fish and restore them on the East Coast. But the fish are coming back, and there's a lot of media out about this. It's great for fishermen. This is a Washington Post article about the fish coming back. This is what it's all about. People getting out onto our nation's rivers, being able to catch fish that had almost been decimated, but brought back. This is a female American shad. She's traveled about 12,000 miles for this gentleman to catch on fly. Many people now fish for these animals with flies. This is a sampling of flies uh, that people use to fish for American shad. They're meant to look like copepods, which the shad feed on in the ocean. But it's all about getting people out onto the river to enjoy our rivers and to be able to fish again for fish like American shad. And also possibly to be able to eat them again if the fishery is reopened. This is uh, the Potomac River Commission's biologist Jim Cummins and the last waterman in Northern Virginia, Lewis Harley, with the traditional cooking of the American shad that Native Americans did so long ago. This was this year on the Potomac River and they cooked them for students that had released the fish onto the river. It's all about bringing our rivers back healthy to have the ecosystems be complete. And the herring, or shad, the American shad is the largest herring, is the clock spring species. It is the species that consumes plankton and transfers energy from our oceans into our river animals such as osprey, bald eagles, river otters, blue herons, and striped bass. The project is featured on the Interstate Commission for the Potomac River Basin's website. You can get to that website at www.potomacriver.org. Click on Living Resources and you can see a full historical summary of this project, how you can do a similar project in your area, and the importance of the wonderful partnership between the Potomac River Commission, Fish and Wildlife Service, local school students, and environmental nonprofit organizations. It's partnerships like this that are going to help bring back our nation's animals in the future. Thank you, Sandy. That was a great and, and very quick overview <laughs> of, your, uh, of your work and fascinating. It was a great story. And I'd like to remind uh, folks who might be tuning in, please email, phone in, or use your push to talk microphone if you have any questions. But I'm going to jump off and ask you the first one since we're, we're sitting in such close proximity. And that is, how did you get interested in this subject? How did, how did you uh, decide to write a book on it? Mark, back in 1995, I was working with a program with Montgomery County, Maryland for students to help restore their streams in the county. I'm a fisheries biologist by training and have helped uh, preserve some marine protected areas in the Florida Keys. When these students, uh, my whole mission is to have students be able, and adults too, moms and dads and citizens, be able to help bring back our uh, nation's fish. And when in 1995 we were offered the ability to come and help Fish and Wildlife Service release fish, and then we had an opportunity to raise the fish, it was just a great and exciting thing to be able to do to help the students get involved. Uh, once the students were raising the fish successfully and releasing them into the river, the other parts of the habitat re restoration that had to happen, such as putting a fishway in the Little Falls Dam, uh, were really something I wanted the students to be involved with. And so that picture of the students presenting their reasoning that, that Corps of Engineers should put a fishway in the Little Falls Dam was really a crowning moment because the, the students got active in helping a process happen that allowed the fish to then come back and use this part of their river for their spawning grounds. So really what makes it exciting for me and, and what makes me want to do this is to enable students and citizens to be a part of the restoration process that agencies like Fish and Wildlife have really perfected as far as uh, the technology for raising and releasing these animals and, and to have the citizens per participate in that process. Why is it important to get the students involved? Why, why is that a demographic you chose to work with? The students right now in our nation's schools are doing quite a bit of environmental education projects. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they study uh, case studies where 
they can't do a hands-on part of it. So there's a real big push across our country right now to have students become active and to have a hands-on part of these restoration projects. There's a lot of students that plant trees and raise plants and plant plants to green their schools. It's a little bit harder to have a partnership where you actually raise fish. And I wanted to mention that uh, fish and wildlife hatcheries around the country are doing outreach with local uh, schools. And so if you out there in the viewing audience uh, can access information for your local fish and wildlife or state hatchery or nursery, you might be able to recreate something like this. But to involve the students, they are the next generation of leaders. They're going to be the adults that inherit our natural resources and have to figure out ways that we don't even can't even think of right now to possibly restore uh, animals that may become threatened in our lifetime. So to have students participate when they're in school is going to make them be better informed and educated adults to help figure out our uh, solutions to problems in the future. Did you see the students' attitudes changing after they worked hands-on with the fish? I mean, it's fairly rare to get actual field biology experience in elementary school. Yes, and in this story, the elementary students started the project, but we also worked with middle and high mm -hmm. school students. The students featured in the book are start out as elementary students. By middle school, they were doing the projects such as uh, native tree nurseries, and they were doing other projects, rallying around the idea of bringing the water quality up in their river and the Chesapeake Bay for the returning fish. So by having the fish project, it's almost a um, kind of a rallying uh, animal to get them to think about water quality and to help install uh, projects as they go into middle and high school. But now we work with middle and high school students in restoring fish, and there's programs throughout Maryland, Virginia, really around the country, uh, where middle and high school students do these, these same kind of restoration projects. But the American Shad Project was such a great success story where the students had a direct role. Uh, I see right now some kind of cynicism in the students around the country, and it's important for students not to be cynical, but to take action. And this is a great story to show people that not just students, but ordinary citizens can actually help to bring back an animal. And right now the American Shad is back in the Potomac, and so it's really a tangible success story. Why do you think students who aren't participating in something like this are cynical? What, that was an interesting point you just made. The programs across the country now, there's a lot of bad news out there. We're facing global warming effects. We're facing extinction of species. Uh, students hear about this and learn about it in the classroom and often aren't given the opportunity to actually help change that situation. And so it's important that across our country, students are given opportunity, even if it's just to plant a tree in their, at their school or their home, to help restore our natural resources so they, they, they don't feel like everything is, is uh, going in a, at a, in a bad direction. That's a good point. I'd just like to break away for a second and remind folks, and we'll run that number again, if you wanted to call in or email in or fax in or even use your push to talk microphone, a, a question for Sandy who wrote this fascinating and award-winning book, uh, please, please do so. What would you recommend to a, a school, you mentioned plant a tree or so on, what, what could schools do if they say didn't have a hatchery in close proximity? Are there some other projects to get kids more connected to nature? Absolutely, a very good question. In the book, uh, I t in the middle of the book, this book isn't just about a, a, a fish success story. The middle of the book is all about habitat greening projects that students can do. Uh, there's many projects such as planting native trees, uh, schoolyard habitat and wetlands. The Fish and Wildlife Service runs a great schoolyard habitat project. Mm -hmm. In the book, there are listings for these various resources, how people can get hooked up with native plant nurseries, with native Native environmental groups, because oftentimes groups like the Audubon Society, um, Trout Unlimited, will offer within their group uh, fish fish hatching. Um, trout Unlimited runs Trout in the Classroom, where students can hatch trout. But it's very easy, oftentimes, for teachers, parents, and students to raise plants and to plant trees, to create a rain garden in their school. Uh, Maryland has a Green Schools program. 
where there's funding available, and so does Virginia and many states, funding available to do uh, schoolyard habitat projects. So the teacher doesn't even have to take the students to the stream or river. They can improve the water quality of their schoolyard. And so if you get the book or if you look at the website, potomacriver.org, Fish and Wildlife Service has a wonderful, in the Chesapeake Bay region, the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program at their field office, where you can find out native plants and how you can plant them in your area to clean up the water quality of your local river or stream. This reminds us of a, a guest we had on about a year ago, Richard Louv, who wrote a, a book called Last Child in the Woods and, and, and talked about an issue. Uh, he coined uh, nature deficit disorder and, and uh, Bob Pyle, who's also, who was on just a couple months ago actually, talked about uh, uh, extinction of experience and, and so on. Have you followed that debate at all and, and, and do you have some thoughts about reconnecting children to nature? Obviously the book deals with that subject hands on, but it seems your unique background as author, educator, marine biologist, you may have an interesting perspective on that. Absolutely, and for those of you out there who are uh, national at a national park or a fish and wildlife refuge, those of you that work with students, this is a real issue. Our students today go home, they play, they watch TV, they play re uh, videos. It's so important to get students outside. And sometimes teachers will say, I don't have the time. I have to meet the standards and, and do the pr appropriate uh, education for the testing procedure. But programs like the SHAD program, like the Nat uh, Growing Native, like the Fish and Wildlife ha Schoolyard Habitats program, these programs are linked to curriculums. They do allow teachers to teach the subject that is going to be tested, but also get the students outside. Richard Lowe's book, No Child Left Behind, very important concept. It shows that without getting students outside, without having them experience our natural world, there are consequences. And so people like me, outdoor educators and biologists around the country, it's our mission now, and it's really rising up across our nation to involve students in actual projects, in getting them tuned into the outdoors again, and part of, to realize the vast ecosystem that we're all a part of, and get them involved with it. So the environmental education push, the service learning is another one. Across the country, the viewing audience out there, you all may have service learning programs in your, your county, in your state, where your students can actually get credit for planting trees, for raising fish, they get school credit now. Across the United States, there's a national project called, it's the Learn Serve Project. And in the book, I list the service learning and learn serve information. You can get funding to do a tree planting or fish projects, and then your students can also get credit service learning credit. So it's really very exciting. I think in the, in the Shenandoah River Basin, one high school got $150,000 through a Learn Serve wow. grant, and they are investigating how a problem with smallmouth bass, what's causing a problem with die-offs of smallmouth bass in the Shenandoah, and they are also planting schoolyard habitats at their high school. So the money's there, and the interest in there is there, and I encourage all of you out there Look up these funding sources, get a copy of the book, it's got a list of them. Look at the web. There's really a lot of programming out there available for students and teachers right now and for natural resources right. managers. I love the list in the back. And for those of you who don't have the book, you can you can find it online or if you happen to be at NCTC, we'll be selling it tonight. But the list of resources on the back all have little fish by them, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Exactly. Um, so it, it, it's very valuable that way. It, it's very important to note, too, that the projects that students do as far as tree plantings, and many people out there, you've probably done a tree planting or a sure. trash We've pickup. Done them on site here. Pretty and much. what's important to realize is that the stream down from you flows into a river that then flows into either the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. And everything you do upstream affects the animals such as American shad, salmon, and eventually bald eagles and osprey. Everything you do to clean up your neighborhood and your school helps the river and stream near you. Good point. Let's talk a little more about shad. When you began your talk, you mentioned it was America's forgotten fish. And I'd hazard to say a lot of Americans have never heard of shad. Um, how, did, how do people forget about shad? Why is it uh, not as, as much in the news as, say, salmon or, or 
more popular fish. American shad declined in the 40s and 50s to the point that many people didn't con eat them anymore. Uh, they, the closing of the fishery in 1981 and 2 in the, in the Chesapeake Bay area uh, prevented watermen from capturing them and selling them locally. So it kind of fell out of the consciousness of the East Coast folks. On the West Coast, as of y'all on the West Coast, the American shad that are on the West Coast are very much in the forefront of the thoughts of the West Coast folks because they're viewed almost as an invasive. It's a, it's a fish that never was there. Um, but on the East Coast, what happened was with the decline of the fish due to pollution and overfishing, and the building of the dams, their numbers decreased and we couldn't bring them back at the point and so people pretty much forgot about them. But now that they're coming back, we're hoping that the consciousness will be raised because they are really our East Coast salmon and they're so important for the ecosystem of the Chesapeake Bay, all of the bays along the East Coast. They occur uh, from as far north as Canada all the way down to Florida. And so each spring when these fish would return, back when the Native Americans were here, uh, were the primary people here, that was their main food source. With the advent of refrigeration, of course, we have food year-round now, but back in the spring, people had lean times by late winter. And so the fish were incredibly important, and were inc incredibly important to George Washington when the troops were starving at Valley Forge, a Native American shad, uh, were brought in to feed the troops because that was a source of fresh meat. I think you mentioned in your book too actually wasn't uh, Washington able to fish for shad right at Mount Vernon there? George Washington, our first president, was a huge <laughs> shad fisherman and uh, I'm going to open a picture here and let's see if we can zoom up on it with the camera. Um, this is a picture right here, you can see that, of Mount Vernon. You can see the house on the top of the hill and there's a schooner, there's a schooner coming to pick up the shad that George Washington had captured on the Potomac River. George Washington had problems on the farm and if it hadn't been for the, sh the salting and shipping of American shad from the Potomac River, he probably would have lost his farm on Mount Vernon. But the fish were incredibly valuable and you can see there uh, that George Washington shipped them via schooner to as far away as the West Indies. That picture, by the way, was donated by Mount Vernon uh, when the students and I started to write the book uh, by Jim Reese, head of Mount Vernon. Because of, wa of George Washington's dependence on American Shad to keep his farm, it's very important, was very important to our first president. How did he um, preserve them? Were they salted, smoked? If you ever visit uh, Mount Vernon, there's a, a small fish uh, drying room. They were salted in giant barrels mm -hmm. and loaded onto the schooners where they were preserved. They could be shipped for long distances. So they were salted. Uh, the Native Americans would split them open and roast them. And this was, they would carry them with them for a long time because they could dry them via smoking. Fascinating. I'd like to remind folks, if you do have a question, I've been having a good time and I've got lots more questions. <laughs> but if any of you have a question, please do feel to, free to call, email, um, or use your microphones to, to ask Sandy a question. And if you'd like, we've got a live video on the on loaded up if they would like to run that. Oh, Could okay. That well, run? We, yeah, we'll try and get that run. And, and yeah, there's a live video. Yep. While we're we punching, can, we can see some shad underwater. At oh, Great cool. Falls. And while we're punching that up, let me ask you one more quick question. You talked about uh, one of the challenges were invasive species in the Potomac. Uh, is are there any issues with the shad as regards water quality in the Potomac? I, Absolutely. Uh, right now the water quality is supporting a great return of the shad in the Potomac, but we always want to be vigilant uh, as far as keeping toxics out of the water. There are still a lot of pollutants going into the Potomac, and so right now the emphasis as far as students go is to have them walk the streams, to keep monitoring the streams, to see if we can catch pollution events such as oil. Mm -hmm. uh, we always want to try and keep upgrading our sewage treatment plants and our septic systems, cleaning out of septic systems is very important. We want to keep the water quality good so that the fish can continue to return. Uh, American shad are in the main stem of the river and that is uh, why the water clarity and quality is very important in the main stem of this large river. Great. Well, let me bring up another issue that's close to my heart, and that's history. Um, those of you who haven't seen the book, it's actually a wonderful history book, uh, in addition to a, a, an activist book about getting your hands dirty and, and doing some real work. And that came out in your, your 
PowerPoint. You had those nice etchings. And uh, I have to make a plug for our archives. <laughs> we, we, uh, we trace our roots to the U.S. Fish Commission, which I suspect might have been um, involved in, in transferring the shad to the Pacific Coast. I know they, they move striped bass out there, too. So that, that sounds like their, their type of work. And, and one of the pictures is, is an original we have in our archives. But um, the history is very interesting. What, what made you want to include the history of the shad? Because you could very well have written this as just, you know, this is a project we did a couple of years ago, and, and look at this. Why did you want to include that element? The, the history of the shad is very important because, again, it's a fish that many people have forgotten about, and it's so important to the founding of our country. John McPhee wrote a wonderful book called uh, The Founding Fish yep. about how our country's founding was so based on important commercial fish such as American shad. But when we started, when the fish came back and the Fish and Wildlife Service biologists netted them and they had the hatchery mark, and we decided to write this up because it was a success story. Right. Many interesting people came forward with historical documentation of how important shad were. The print that hangs in Mount Vernon of the schooner coming up to pick up the shad was, was I got a call one day and was donated by the head of Mount Vernon. Right. Uh, an, the art print with the picture of Fort Washington mm -hmm. and the history yeah. of the U.S. Fish Commission was discovered in a tiny art gallery by one of my neighbors. And because I was writing the story of the, of the success story of the, of the raising and release and comeback of the shad, I was given that as a present. And when I saw the picture, I didn't realize it was the history of sending shad to San Francisco from the East Coast. So I actually had the art gallery owner take the picture apart and look at the information on the back. And it was a Harper's Weekly 1888 story about the U.S. Fish Commission. And that, that history about the United States government trying to send various important fish, such as American shad, to the West Coast to beef up our fee the, the food supply of our country really had fallen from our nation's consciousness. So putting that history in the book and in the talks that I give is so important because many people feel that invasive fish such as the snakehead right. are so bad for our rivers. But it's important to reflect that years ago we thought it was important to bring other fish to different areas yep. of the country to raise them. And this is a continually emerging story. So if anybody out there has information about <laughs> shad, American shad, please contact me because it's important for us to raise the consciousness of people and students in our country to the history of our fish and why they're so important and why they need to be restored. So history is a very important part of the story. And Sandy, how would they contact you? Do you have a website up? Or? You can reach me through the book publisher, Let okay. the River Run Silver Again. If you Google that, it'll bring up the information that how you can contact me Great. and through PotomacRiver.org, okay. the website for the Interstate Commission on Potomac River Fishery the Interstate Commission on the Potomac River Basin, and that website has all of the information about the American Shad Restoration Project with the Partners Fish and Wildlife Service. So either through the book or the website, potomacriver.org would be great. Okay. I think we have your video ready to go. Do you want to set this up for us? Yeah. Tell us what we're going to be looking at here. When people think, uh, we were unable to film the return of the shad through the fish ladder. National Geographic Television tried to do it, but the Little Falls Dam is extremely dangerous, and right. the and the National Geographic's TV cameras were unable to be lowered by the dam. So, uh, in keeping with the theme of citizens doing remarkable work with our fish, this next video was taken by a kayaker, a recreational kayaker who was paddling at Great Falls National Park. Right. We had not gotten any underwater footage of the shad returning to Great Falls, but in reality, this person called me when he read the book and said, I have got underwater footage. You can see it here playing. Yeah. These are fish, American shad, swimming up to the person's kayak and what they were doing is spawning and you can see here they're swimming up and they're throwing they broadcast spawn they're throwing the eggs up toward the kayak <laughs> and the eggs are swirling around so that they can stay away from predator minnows 
And How this did is, he get this footage? <laughs> this footage was donated from, a, from a, a citizen who is actually a biologist at Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. That's in Maryland. And he had just a, a small web ca uh, uh, electric camera, flipped his boat, shot this water under his kayak, and, and videotaped the fish spawning. This is below Great Falls, near the uh, Little Falls Fishway. Yeah. Uh, below it in the Potomac River, and so National Geographic Television was unable to film this event, but a but a citizen was. I've kayaked that area. That's uh, it's hard enough to stay upright, <laughs> let alone try to film there. So that's quite an achievement. In addition to being stunning footage, that is, I'm very impressed. And it's so hard <laughs> sometimes to uh, to monitor our fish. It's very difficult to recapture. American Shad at Great Falls and at many of our areas because it's so dangerous. Yeah. You can't lower traditional uh, nets, you can't use a seine, you have to use dip nets, uh, and it's also equally dangerous to photograph them. So again, citizens out there, if anybody comes to the Potomac River and is able to get great underwater footage, <laughs> you never know, you may be the next famous cameraman. <laughs> I encourage all people to submit footage because uh, Discovery Television, National Geographic are still interested in this project, and we would love to get some good footage. Okay. Since you are an author, let's talk just a little about the book. Um, it's, it's very interesting, the, the awards, um, which you showed briefly up there, are from the Isaac Walton League, uh, a traditional sportsman's group named after the, the father of fly fishing, among other things, and then uh, the Green uh, Earth Book Award from Newton Morasco Foundation that did a lot last year. Um, or this year, excuse me, to, to promote Rachel Carson Centennial and, and Children in Nature and so on. So what's interesting, you got awards from, from two um, quite different organizations with, with different missions, and that's very exciting. Was this the first book you wrote, Sandy? Yes, uh, this is actually the second. The first book that the students and I wrote was called Pearls of the River, okay. and it was published by the school system. And then a publisher picked up the story, and the students renamed it Let the River Run Silver Again in honor of the river running silver with herring. But it's the first book that I've done. I'm a fisheries biologist by training right. and uh, had worked with um, the states of North Carolina and Florida to preserve habitat for uh, grouper and also with the state of Maryland to work with striped bass. Uh, working with students was new to me and it's been quite an exciting experience and so when I was offered to write this book to document the success story I wanted to include uh, the fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh yeah. graders that worked with us. The Interstate Commission on Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation gener generously donated office space and, and photo archiving support. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Harrison Lake Hatchery, provided wonderful pictures that you saw on the presentation earlier, underwater shots of baby shad. Um, and so it's been really a group effort and a wonderful project to be involved with. And anyone out there, if you decide or that you want to be involved in a fish project or a habitat project, if you're at a national park or a fish and wildlife refuge, and you do end up having a success story, I would highly encourage you to write it up, put it on the web, video it, get it in a student film festival, because sharing the success stories is so important. And the reason I wrote this book is to share a real success story with uh, people around the country. And one of the focuses in schools now is to have students read nonfiction, true life books, like the book on Rachel Carson that right. came out. And conservation success stories are not few and far between, but the books are. And yeah. so we really need to get more of these success stories out there. Which reminds me, I need to make a plug. We would love to have the student film, when it's completed, submitted to our film festival out here every, every November. We have the American Conservation Film Festival, and we, we have a student category, and we're right in the neighborhood. So are, are they going to finish their film shortly? They have. <laughs> they love they, to get that out. They here. are finishing it by the end of winter semester, so it should be a matter of weeks. It's completely student done, as you saw in the yeah, pictures earlier. They're filming all aspects of it. They went out with the watermen. They filmed. Uh, they're going to use the clip you saw of the, of the fish uh -huh. swirling under the kayak as they're back to Great Falls <laughs> National Park. And so that, uh, 
that film, which is being done by Bethesda Chevy Chase High School in Maryland, should be ready uh, by January. So that would be a, quite yeah. a pleasure to have them enter it into your nice film It would be nice to screen festival. it here and, and host them out here. That would be wonderful. That would be fantastic. We're almost out of time. It's gone really fast because it was such a great topic. But we, we always ask people, what next? You, you wrote this wonderful book. You've, you've had this great experience with, with young people and Shad. What, what are your future projects? My hope right now is to uh, help develop programs that students can do to help bring back our rivers and streams. Right now we're in project development uh, with Growing Native, which is a program where students are developing native tree ha uh, nurseries at their schools. Mm -hmm. We're trying to expand that into a multi-state and across the, state, uh, across the nation. That's done by Potomac Cur Conservancy and the um, Interstate Commission on Potomac River is helping uh, support that. So really to to develop programs that students can use in their school and in their community is something I'm going to be working with in the future. Also working with Trout Unlimited, with Trout in the Classroom, anybody out there that lives in a trout area, contact your local Trout Unlimited chapter because that trout in the classroom has really expanded. You can raise trout and release them into your water. So really to promote programs that youth can use to actually help restore our, our nation's uh, plants and animals. Great. Well, hopefully and we can work, get you out here again to update us. And work with great us. partners like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's just a uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has been, it's wonderful to have a federal agency so uh, open and, and, and able to work with youth and to have such great technology available to bring into the classroom. It's been a real pleasure. Well, we're trying to work more and more with children in nature, and this is a great success story, and I really want to appreciate you uh, or thank you for coming out here this afternoon and, and sharing your book and your story with us. I want to thank those of you who took the time to tune in this afternoon and, and uh, hear Sandy's rare success story, which is, is wonderful. And uh, I look forward to having you come back in January. We do this series once a month. We'll have another conservationist in action. And once again, thank you, Sandy. This was, this was super. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>